This is the Dog Savant Podcast with your host, Brett Endes. Hey everyone, this is Brett. This is the Dog Savant Podcast, uh, episode 16. Technically, it is an episode of the podcast, even though we're doing a little car video today. Uh, my producer, Jordan, still in New York, so we're doing some of these just to get you a weekly episode. And me, as you can tell, I'm dressed in camo. Why? So, me and Boo, we're coming back from a hunting trip. Didn't get anything, not successful, didn't spend too much time out in the field, but it was fun, and it was a great experience for me to share with my dog. He loved it. I had a great time just being alone with him and just connecting. You know, that's really what dogs are meant to do. A lot of these dogs in our world today have a very convenient, uh, almost an indulgent lifestyle, and it is really not affording them to live a very content existence. I find that dogs that do have more of these outlets, and they don't have to be hunters, they don't have to be 24-7 working on a farm, but giving them these outlets once in a while, getting them into their more natural environments and finding their natural purposes, you know, or at least simulating that, um, it's good for them, it's good for them to do that time with their owner, they really like to connect with us, uh, but connection isn't about giving them a thousand treats, it's not about loving on them or indulging them or giving them constant attention, it's about tapping into what they're their purposes and their, their natural instincts, which is to help humans survive. And none of us are surviving. Whether I caught a pig or not today uh, wasn't going to change whether or not I ate dinner. So there's less at stake. And Bowie, by no means is he a hunting dog. He's not trained to track. He's not a bay dog. He's just my partner. He's well behaved. He's listened. He stays discreet so we can, you know, spot and stalk our prey. But He's just my buddy, he's my hunting partner, that's it. And he has a great time doing that. He loves camping with me. Uh, just all these natural things that, you know, I would assume that we just, it's how we live with dogs. You know, not too long ago, just the past few hundred years, things have changed. So uh, dogs have just kind of come along for this technology ride, but they're not seeing the world any different than they were thousands of years ago. We do, they don't. And unfortunately, by not tapping into the way that they are seeing the world, we miss out on so many elements of their life and just enjoying them more. Um, Bowie is so happy right now. He's so relaxed. He got a three and a half hour ride home and he is chill because we spent a few hours in the woods. We camped out last night and it'll be good. You know, we don't have to do this again for, for a while. I mean, we'll do our hiking and whatnot, but we don't have to, you know, take him out. But he got his fill and I got my fill. You know, I think we have instincts too that we're not tapping into enough as humans as well. Um, so that's where we're coming from. I got also, I don't know if it works or not, or at least not for me because I'm not a good hunter, but Hex, right? This is that technology I've spoken about before where animals can detect the, uh, the, very, the very subtle electro, electrical currents that we give off, our muscle, our nervous system energy, and it's like their sixth sense can pick up on that, and they've done a lot of studies, um, and what they find is that when you wear this suit, it blocks off the transmission of those. So if you wear it underneath or over your clothing, it tends to create that barrier. Does it work? No. Sure, it's a comfortable suit. Looks kind of cool, but um, why not, right? Uh, you know, I know energy is a real thing by working with dogs for all these years, and they're in tune with something beyond the obvious, beyond the five senses, beyond the conditioning. Uh, beyond the psychology that we have to at least understand and respect and relate to. Um, and wild animals are, are on this grid of existence that's beyond explanation. They're so attuned. I mean, the, these pigs, I just know they knew as soon as we arrived at the trailhead. I mean, even miles away, they knew we were there. There, were, there was no pigs in sight. They're so attuned. Um, but anyway, good stuff. Funny also when I when, when I roll up into the city again and I'm wearing the camo, the way people look at me, they think I'm either in the National Guard or I'm there to do something no good. Uh, Los Angeles isn't a hub for uh, outdoors people, so I kind of stand out a little bit with my thinking. Look, I'm from New York City and it didn't really fit in too well where I grew up, but it's just kind of in my heart it feels right to be out in the wilderness once in a while, even though I grew up in the city. Um, so that's that. Uh, let's see. So let me kind of go kind of in reverse here. So uh, as far as the podcast, it's episode 16. Um, you know, any of you who are listening or if you're new, uh, my name is Brett Endes. I'm a professional dog trainer. I specialize in severe problem behaviors and puppy development. I'm host of a show called The Untrainables on Facebook Watch. You can catch it there. Uh, we just had another episode come out today, uh, Saturday. It's doing great. Uh, really cool one. Really neat dog and owner. 
Um, and for you guys who have been watching, or if you're new, please subscribe to the podcast, share, follow me on YouTube, all that good stuff. Uh, we're going to just keep putting stuff out there for you guys, a lot of content, a lot of information that's going to help dogs and owners. Uh, this stuff works in the real world. We've got a lot of clients who have confirmed that this information I'm giving has really you know, helped them where some training or interpretations of dog behavior hasn't, so I figured I'd share it out there, uh, despite you know some of the naysayers and people that don't want to open their minds to seeing dogs from a different perspective, which actually might help connect with them in a way that is uh, beyond our human interpretation that we make towards dog behavior instead of seeing it from their point of view and relating to it, you know, from that perspective. Uh, let's see. Oh, last week I did a Bill Church's podcast, Bow Wow Bill. That was really neat. Um, I've never done a, a, a format like that before as far as like a podcast with another person. I've done shows and interviews and whatnot, but this is just kind of a free conversation. What was great about it, and this is the whole point, this is why I think it's a great thing that Bill's doing, is he's connecting with all these dog owners that get it, or dog trainers that get it. And I'm not saying get it like we all think the same way. We're all very different, and we have, a, you know, kind of a difference in how we interpret dogs and their behavior, but there's a constant thing going on there um, in how we're rationally seeing it. We're not letting our emotions drive us to interpret or understand or act in a way that's going to, you know, deal with these behaviors and dogs, the problem behaviors, uh, which is the other side of the fence. You know, people who promote purely positive, um, the safe spacing the dogs, all that. It's just purely emotional. There's no rational thought. There's no objective thing going on here. It's just a pure feeling, which, look, feelings have a, have a place in the world, but when it comes to animals and when we're trying to really, at times, save their lives, that, that, that shit has to just get put on the back burner and we have to see what's going on despite it being politically incorrect or uncomfortable or not in your psychological schema as far as how you feel dogs should be or why you feel the dog has these behavioral issues or the problem or the lack of listening that you're experiencing. It's rarely coming from that emotional perspective. You have to have a lot of experience and you have to be very pragmatic and you have to address dog problems at the root of their, of their causality. Otherwise, you're, you're lost. You're just treating symptoms and the root is gonna always make the symptoms arise. Um, so that's why I think Bill is great. We had a great conversation. It was fun. I think there was some funny moments in there too. That's what's cool because this kind of podcast you know, it's kind of a stream of consciousness. I don't really have more than just the concept that I that I plan out before I hit record. And uh, I just kind of talk, you know, I try to fill the, the airspace here, try to keep it relevant and on track. But with me and Bill, it was great, great conversation. And I, of course, want to do some more uh, podcasts on my show as well. So I'm going to try to uh, have more guests, other dog trainers, good dog trainers, um, and just people from all the walks of life. I mean, God, how cool would it be if I had, like, the guy who founded Hex on the show, right? How that would totally relate to dog dog behavior. They're animals, but they're coexisting with humans, so it's a whole other realm. Where at least in the wild, the uh, you know the animals are in their own uh, terrain, their own environments. We share an environment, natural habitat with our dogs. Um, very interesting because of that. Um, you know, so hey, if you're watching and you have a good idea, or you know someone that might make a good guest, uh, reach out to them. Let them know. I'm hunting. I'm looking for guests on the, on the Dog Savant podcast. Um, let me see. What else can we talk about today? Oh, you know what? I'll do a QA. and I, I have to go by memory. Um, I have been doing some videos to answer some questions for anyone who's been watching me on Trainables. That's kind of a separate thing as far as through the network. Uh, but in the podcast, I like to answer some of the questions. And if anyone wants to send me separate questions, whether it be through my email, dogtrainingla.com, uh, or on Facebook, Facebook, uh, the dog savant, anywhere. Just let me know. Make a video back. Send me, your, you know, show me your dog. Let's see what's going on. I'd love to help more people out in the virtual world, not just uh, my real clients here in Los Angeles. Uh, so we have a question. Uh, oh, it good. It was related to um, today's episode. It was. How do I teach my dog to not climb on the table? So if you saw today's episode, it's a tugboat. He's a dog that was getting up on the table. And the big part of it was just the owner was kind of allowing it or the previous owner was. And it was sort of an inconsistent where sometimes they tell him to get off. Sometimes they think it was fun to see him on it. So it's a mixed message. And that's the one thing about dogs, black and white. They do not think in gray areas. So if you nine out of 10 times don't let your dog on the table, 
and then one time out of 10 you allow it, even not encouraging it, it just accomplishes, which accomplishment equals reward, it tells your dog the potential to happen is there. And number one, it's still gonna be a problem you're struggling with if the potential's there. And your dog is gonna get confused and, get, and not really be sure of what you want from them. So even to be fair to them, we have to be black and white consistent. Once that black and white consistency is delivered, and they're, they, they get it and that, that element of conditioning is there where it's like, well, this is the norm in this scenario, then we don't have to be so consistent and, and the point is made, they've learned the lesson. Um, so with that, what I would do is step one is try to create lack of access, especially if your dog is willing to jump up on the table while, you're, while they're in front of you. Because there's two versions of this. The one version is you're there watching, the dog still has no qualms about it and they're doing it. And that's something where you can redirect them. So if you see them planning on jumping before they do it, you can redirect them into a command like a sit or a down or to tell them to go to their place. And it's just counter conditioning them to instead of going up towards the table to mentally kind of draw back and to learn that that action doesn't take effect. Now also if the dog is doing it in front of you, it's a good idea to, and they, they accomplish it, but you didn't catch them in the act, you still want to teach them the off command like we did in the episode. So at least it's being discouraged. It doesn't have that much accomplishment as far as how long the dog can it last on the table when they get away with it. Most dogs though are pretty smart and they know when you're watching them or not and when they can or can't get away with it. So that's why you wanna be so consistent with the hopes that it will carry over where they won't be sneaky and wait till you're not in the room, you know, keeping an eye on them. So then how do we do it if we're not watching them? Well, that's where we're gonna to have to use technology. You would hope that you'd made a clear enough message so at least there's just these little loose ends where they're trying to do it when there's just too much temptation or there's enough time on their hands, it just gets the best of them. So there's a lot of things you can do. They have all types of, you know, you can go on Google and type counter surfing dog deterrent or whatever type of things. They have the snappy trainer, they have the scat mats, they have this thing where it's compressed air and it has a sensor. So if your dog gets within range, it sprays. And you just wanna kind of create that, that startle, not to freak them out, not traumatize them, just to create that, whoa, that's not gonna create the cause and effect I had thought. And dogs are pretty influential you know, to stimuli. So if it's something that they don't like or it's an unknown, they're gonna quickly be discouraged. Um, again, that's secondary to just taking the time to teach them, but some dogs you do have to use something a little bit beyond the obvious to teach them a skill, especially if the issue is based on them getting away with it when you're not home. So there's a lot of items out there. I don't recommend one because there's so, I mean, look, you can, you can create something, you can get some cans with pennies and string them along the counter. There's a lot of tips, and, and, and for something like that, it's really not that straightforward. It's just whatever's going to discourage your particular dog based on how they see it so that they know even when you're not around to not jump on the counters. Okay, I think I explained that enough, um, but again, you want to be as preventative as possible. You want to teach your dog not to scan in general. Then you want to teach your dog not to scan higher surfaces like counters, couches, tables, things like that. And then the third step is you want to be able to show them that even when you're not watching them or able to catch them in the act, there is still some way to discourage that behavior. Um, some people like their dogs on furniture. You know, that's something where it's to each his own. I personally don't think a dog should be on a table, you know, where you eat. But my dogs are allowed on the couch and beds because they're behaved and when they're on it, they're calm and relaxed and respectful. Uh, some people and some clients of mine, they're not there yet, so they have to work on some of the relationship end of things before they can allow those liberties. Uh, but either way, you want to approach it from the root of it all the way up to the, well, now the issue's happening. What do we do once the fire is blazing and how do we put it out? So again, that's what I find is that if you're more preventative, you end up not having to always put out fires in the first place. Okay, so I think I explained that. Um, let's see, we keep these podcasts kind of short. I try to do 15 to 30 minutes at most. Um, let's see, so we've got today, Saturday. It's Saturday the 29th, I believe. So we got episode four of the Untrainable. Three, three of the Untrainables is out now on Facebook Watch. Um, again, subscribe, rate, review my podcast. Go on my YouTube channel, we'll make more videos. Uh, YouTube.com backslash, uh, I think it's Dog Training LA. But you can go to my website, dogtrainingla.com and link to it from there as well. And uh, keep supporting what I do. I really appreciate it. And keep sending those questions. I really want to help as many dogs as possible. Um, thank you and have a great day.